Some years ago, I found myself at a raw milk rally. Raw milk is milk that hasn't been pasteurized. Pasteurization is a heat treatment of milk that kills potential deadly bacteria that might be in that milk, but it also changes the milk. And there is a small group of consumers who prefer their milk raw, perhaps for health reasons, they might digest it better, perhaps they like the flavor, perhaps they've simply consumed it their whole lives. It's just a choice that they make. So there we were at this raw milk rally, and I met a man named Greg. Greg introduced himself to me as a raw omnivore. And I knew from that phrase that he meant that not only did he eat his fruits and vegetables raw, his dairy and eggs raw, but also his meat raw. And I asked, I mean, do you really eat raw beef and pork and chicken? And I'm thinking about the festering ball of salmonella on my countertop that is a whole raw chicken and how I try to avoid contaminating my salads with it and getting sick and this guy might eat raw chicken and he said you know you, you do need to treat chicken differently than other meats because in fact it's far better it, the flavor is far better when it's at room temperature and so he suggested that you take your chicken out of your refrigerator, you put it on your countertop for two or three hours before dinner, let it come to room temperature for the full gourmet experience. He said, but you do have to be careful. There was that one time. He took the chicken out of his refrigerator, he put it on the countertop in anticipation of dinner that night, but he got sidetracked. He ended up having dinner elsewhere and then he went on a three-day vacation with his girlfriend. They returned back to the apartment three days later, forgetting entirely about the chicken the whole time until they opened the door <laughs> of the apartment. And as they were greeted by the stench of the rotting chicken in the kitchen, they walked across the apartment, peered over the chicken on the countertop, and noticed that not only was it stinking and rotting, but it had turned a little bit green. And Greg turned to his girlfriend and said, you might have to take me to the emergency room after this one. He proceeded to eat the chicken. He lived to tell the tale, and he didn't even have to go to the ER that day by some miracle. But Greg embraced a food philosophy that he would live a longer, healthier life if he ate all of his foods raw, including meat. And embracing this philosophy, he also embraced the risk in his decisions. He recognized the risk on that memorable day, in fact, eating a food that probably none of the rest of us would choose to eat. He embraced the risk and ate it anyway. An example, in my opinion, of exercise and free choice of food. And I'm gonna ask that we all be a little more like Greg to improve the climate of free food choice in this country. But keep in mind, you don't actually have to eat stinking green raw chicken in order to do that. <laughs> but increasingly, consumers in the United States are being asked to make specific kinds of food choices. We should eat all of our foods whole, nothing from a box, if you're going to eat corn, for goodness sakes, choose corn that's not been genetically modified. Eat a vegetarian diet. Don't eat anything that's not plant-based, that has eyeballs or a mother. And if you are going to have milk, make sure that it's raw. At the core of all of these calls to actions for consumers is very complex information. If you think about it, I mean, really, do we know about plant genetics as consumers enough to decide if we should go in and make a choice of a GMO food versus an organic food? How do we know that? How do we make that kind of complex decision? Milk microbiology, should I drink raw milk? It's a complex decision at its core. How do we make this decision? I conducted a survey of raw milk advocates some years, years back that actually gave, gives us a little bit of a window into how consumers make these decisions. And so among advocates, an important area of discussion is actually policy. Advocates are seeking policy change. And in the world of raw milk, policy change means having better access to raw milk in the retail marketplace. And so when you walk into a store, raw milk advocates want you to be able to select raw milk right there next to pasteurized milk.
And here in California, we actually have very liberal access to raw milk, and we can go in and buy it in a store. But in other states, you need to go and buy it directly from the farmer, or um, in, in some states still, you need to own part of that cow. There's actually cow share programs where you buy a portion of the cow, you pay the farmer to take care of the cow, to milk the cow for you, and you get the milk in, in, in return. In other states still, there, are no, there is no way to get legal access to raw milk unless you actually are a farmer and milk that cow yourself or milk the goat yourself. And so we have a whole continuum of access to raw milk in this country across all of these different states. And advocates are really pushing for increased retail access in all states. And so we have a continuum where, poli where, where politics happens here from sales being illegal to retail access to raw milk. But if you think about it in the California case when we can walk into a grocery store and find both types of milks, we can find you know, soy milk and almond milk and all kinds of products on the shelf. And we, that's where we're making a choice. And that choice, and whether it's free, and this is the key concept, really depends on the quality of information we have that allows us to, to distinguish between those choices on the shelf. And so we have a second dimension, and that is choice. And I argue that this, in the second dimension, what we want to see in order to see a free choice is that that decision is informed. It's based on information that's relevant to the consumer and that's, that's factual to the degree that information is available on it. And it, it's not a free choice if the decision is based on misinformation, and particularly if the choice is guided by misinformation that would otherwise be very important to that consumer making the choice. And as an advocate, I want to see us in this quadrant, which is where we have access to the foods that are important to us, but we also have quality information to guide us in the choices that, that we would ultimately make. And as an example, I might walk into Alaskan's grocery store here in California and buy raw milk. I've consumed it quite a bit in my life, and I know I feel better when I drink it. And so I might reach out, grab that raw milk, even though I know that it has risks, but I've experienced the benefits and I'm willing to shoulder the risks. But five years ago, pregnant, and when you're pregnant, your, your immune system is compromised. You're not as able to fight off infection if you get an infection. And there, are, there is an infection that can, there are bacteria that can come in raw milk, listeria, in, and that can compromise a pregnancy. So in that case, I actually chose to drink pasteurized milk. And so the same person, different situation, and a different product choice, but free choices in both cases. And I'll guarantee you, my husband will walk in, he will buy pasteurized milk. He doesn't see any difference between pasteurized and raw milk, except that the premium on raw milk, it costs something like three times as much, it burns a hole in his pocket, he will not buy it. And that is a free choice for him. A, a friend I ran into in the grocery store, she had this cart full of raw milk, and I wondered what in the heck is she gonna do with all this, so I asked her, and she says she's going to go on this raw milk diet exclusively for 30 days, a gallon of milk a day, and she's gonna lose a half a pound a day, 15 pounds in a month, and I'm thinking, I think I need this kind of diet, and maybe I'm gonna fill my cart up too until I start counting the calories and say, oh my gosh, and realize there's not actually evidence that this kind of diet works, and so I quipped. Again, she was a friend, so I could be a little rude, and I said, you know, I think you're more likely to lose 15 pounds from an E. coli infection from all of that milk as opposed to actually going on a weight loss program, having a successful weight loss program from all that milk. And she said, but Amanda, raw milk kills E. coli. Raw milk can, or E. coli cannot live in raw milk. And so we walk out of the store, we have the same product, the same cell date, the same producer, but in fact, E. coli does survive in raw milk. And if safety is an important consideration for her, she has made a choice that isn't as free as I would like to see. And so how do consumers make these choices? 
in, in the raw milk movement. And it turns out that consumers make the choices, these more difficult, complicated choices, much like we do in the rest of our lives. And when we have a tough decision that we're making, we often turn to someone in our social networks and we ask them. We ask the best person we can think of who might have more information than us about that topic. And as an example, some months ago, a friend approached me and remember we're in the liberal state of California here and her question was about medical marijuana and she wanted to know the healthiest way of getting the, the marijuana into her body and still have the effect of pain relief for her arthritis. So she did have a prescription, she was interested in pain relief and asked me what's the healthiest way to consume this. And you know, I was flabbergasted. It's not a question I you know, normally get asked in the course of my <laughs> daily life. And then I said, but wait a minute, give me a few days and I'll get back to you. And so I called a friend, he's a chemist, he has background in the commercial distillation of, of cannabis. This is a great guy to ask, right? And so he says, you know, what she needs is she needs to create an alcohol extract. And what this is, so basically, get your favorite bourbon, as high proof as possible, fill it with leaf and bud, put it in your pantry for three to six months, strain out the green, and what you're left with is perhaps the best pain-relieving elixir <laughs> of your life. And so, this is the information I passed on to my friend, and what I want to make clear is I still don't know if that really is the best way for her to consume her medical marijuana, but he was the best expert I had access to. His answer seemed reasonable, and so I passed it down the line. And for all I know, the pantry is filled with bourbon at this moment. <laughs> And so information flows in the raw milk movement in a similar way, and that is it flows from national advocacy groups, their websites, their books, the, the experts that they use and consult with, and it flows to advocates who then pass the information down to their friends and their family circles. And so one question is, what is the information that's getting passed down the chain, and how does that impact free choice of raw milk in, in the United States. In the, survey that, in the survey that I conducted, I asked um, advocates to rate certain statements. I created this raw milk truth and fiction barometer, and so raw milk advocates were to rate these statements on a scale from absolute fiction to absolute truth. And the truths that um, raw milk advocates held, for the most part, centered around the safety of raw milk. Raw milk advocates were very likely to agree that um, raw milk is uniquely safe and that raw milk has components that kills pathogens. And if you ask them, how do they know that? How is this your truth? They will point to a study done of Campylobacter in raw milk. Campylobacter is a potentially deadly pathogen, and what scientists have done is they'll find and verify a batch of clean raw milk, and then they will spike it with, with Campylobacter, a certain strain of Campylobacter, and they will examine it over time to see if it increases, if it decreases, and learn something about the survival of Campylobacter in raw milk as a result. And the results are very compelling in seeing a decline of Campylobacter in raw milk, but the problem is Campylobacter is not the only potential deadly pathogen in milk. In fact, in another study, a number of strains of E. coli actually grew in raw milk over the course of the study. Some of the strains didn't grow, but they didn't decline either. And likewise with listeria, there was a study conducted that showed that there, there was no increase, but also no decline in listeria. So if it was contaminated yesterday, it's still contaminated today and still could pose a risk to consumers. In a salmonella study, actually a um, raw milk farmer here in California had his own milk spiked with salmonella. And we see a slight decline, but certainly nothing that would probably drive us all to go and drink that milk, though maybe we should, we should call Greg about that. <laughs> but the impact then on politics is, is an important point, because again, we have regulators and advocates fighting in the policy domain about regulating raw milk. Regulators hear information like, no, raw milk is uniquely safe. 
because there is that one Campylobacter study, and I'll tell you, this lights the fire under regulators, and then they come out with counter information, and there's one notorious quote, drinking raw milk is like playing Russian roulette with your health. And if you know Russian roulette, you know you have a one in six chance of death in playing Russian roulette, and of course, many of us here would have lived thousands of lives if that were actually true. But on the other side, we have the statement, raw milk is uniquely safe. So raw milk has components in it that kill pathogens quickly and thoroughly enough to, to keep it from, if it is contaminated, ultimately to make it safe. And so we have on each of these sides, we have information that isn't necessarily accurate and probably at the end of the day, not all that useful in informing consumers. In terms of raw milk is uniquely safe, one of the big public problems is that there are raw milk outbreaks. And in, since 2005, there have been 15 outbreaks associated with the pathogen E. coli 0157H7. 15 outbreaks, 44 hospitalizations, many of them children. And here's the political problem. Well, for, first of all, this is always a tragic situation, but let's take a step back and think about it politically. We have an outbreak and news reporters will go and interview mothers. Your child is sick and in the hospital with this food that experts recommend you not even give to your child in the first place, and why are you feeding your child raw milk? And in three of these cases, I remember vividly as I watched the news as these outbreaks were happening, in three of these cases, moms were interviewed and said something along the lines of, I didn't realize the milk could be contaminated. I thought it was completely safe. I didn't realize it, would, it could be contaminated. And so here we have a tragic situation with sick children. And in addition, we have a completely public display in the local paper of the lack of free choice in the raw milk movement. And it's these kinds of public displays of free choice and lack thereof that fuels regulators. I've actually talked to regulators about why do we even care about raw milk? I mean, really, there aren't that many people drinking it, and there, is, there are a lot of resources that the government spends attempting to regulate it. Why do you guys do that? And they've said, Amanda, I mean, aren't you listening to the news and the moms who say, I did not realize it could be contaminated? So I've posed a question to them, hypothetically. What if there were no uninformed moms? What if all the moms had all of the information that regulators had about the safety of raw milk, and they chose to, to, to consume it anyway? I mean, for goodness sakes, I've consumed a lot of raw milk in my lifetime, and there was that memorable month of the gallon of raw milk a day, um, a strategy I can't say was a complete success, but people do drink it knowing the risks. And they say, okay, so you and who else? And this is the best opportunity to tell them about Greg and his stinking, rotting raw chicken that, by the way, Greg says tastes a little bit peppery. <laughs> and this completely stops the conversation because raw milk regulators are not concerned about Greg. They're not concerned about me, and they're not concerned about you either because today, you have learned that raw milk can be contaminated. You will not find yourself in the news saying, but I didn't realize it could be contaminated. You can take this information, look up some of the research if this is an important issue for you, look up some of the research. But what I wanna emphasize is as we go home to our friends and our family and we advocate for some of these complicated choices that we're facing every day, and we urge our friends and family to make certain kinds of choices, let's give them all of the information about their choice. Let's give them the good and the bad information. Let's respect that they may make a different choice from us, but that their choice may be then the best choice for their circumstances, a free choice of food.